Um, I know you've heard a lot about transplant today. I know you've heard a lot about um, dialysis. You heard a little bit about dialysis access. And I wanted to talk uh, to you today about kind of the way I approach um, the care of patients with end-stage renal disease. Because I, I look at myself a little bit differently than many, many surgeons do. I, I think of myself as a surgeon for patients with end-stage renal disease. And I know some of the people here have been at one of my other talks, but, um, and I talk about the comprehensive care of patients who have end-stage renal disease. And what does that mean? So let's, let's go to the next slide. So we have a huge team, a massive team. And I think the first person on that list, Trish Rosenberry, has done, in my mind, more to help with the care of patients, the surgical care of patients with end-stage renal disease uh, on the Eastern Shore than any other person I know. And the reason I think that is that um, about five years ago, the University of Maryland came to uh, the hospital in Easton and said, the transplant program said, hey, let's, let's start something together. Let's offer transplant evaluation and care, and let's offer access care to the patients uh, in Easton. And since that time, we've been building on that. And now we, we, um, we even have a bigger area that we, we help cover. And, and what does that mean? It means that we have, um, in addition to Trish, we have Wendy Greenwood, Deb Evans. They're two nurses that work with us on access as well as transplant. Uh, we work very closely with both Davida and Fresenius. Davida has some of the units up near Easton and Fresenius down in Salisbury. And we work with Peninsula Nephrology, Kidney Health Centers, which is Dr. Hinduja's group. We work with the Interventional Radiology group, uh, both in uh, Salisbury at Peninsula Regional and also up in, um, in Easton. Uh, we work with Shore Regional Health uh, we work with Peninsula Regional Medical Center and, and together with the University of Maryland Division of Transplant. And I think what you get is you get a group of surgeons that uh, are part of this program that uh, all we do is take care of patients who have end-stage renal disease. Um, so when we see an access patient, I would say 50 to 60 percent of what I do is either hemodialysis access or peritoneal dialysis access. And um, in contrast to some of the other people that I, that I know that do access surgery, this is a big part of my, uh, my uh, practice. And uh, I'm on the phone a lot with the nephrologists because we work together uh, in order to care for the patients. So many times before patients even come in to see me, I've had a conversation with Dr. Hinduja or Dr. Khan or Dr. Patel, uh, Dr. Baswell. Um, and we have discussed what, what's best for this patient. Um, and there's times when I get a patient referred for hemodialysis access and I, I talk them out of it because there might be a reason that hemodialysis would be very bad for them and peritoneal dialysis would be much better for them. Uh, so that's kind of what I, why I think about uh, end-stage renal disease comprehensive surgical care. So let's go to the next slide. So what do we do? I do dialysis access, uh, me and three of my partner, or two of my partners. We do dialysis uh, access. I do general surgery in patients with end-stage renal disease. And I do that because I'm, I'm so involved with the nephrologist that if we have to arrange dialysis or we have to uh, manage dialysis, we can do that together. Um, and then we also do transplant evaluation and care. Let's go to the next slide. So when I think about transplantation and I think about dialysis, I, I like to think about opportunities. What are our opportunities? We want to maximize your opportunities to undergo transplant or your opportunities to have the best dialysis possible. So we do living donor transplantation. Uh, the University of Maryland has uh, arguably one of the largest living donor transplant programs in the world. Um, and we've probably done more living donors than most centers in the United States and probably many centers across the world. Uh, we were one of the first centers to do laparoscopic donor nephrectomy, which really changed uh, living donation. 
And then we were the first program on the East Coast to do single port donor nephrectomy, which is where we make a small, about two and a half centimeter in, or two and a half inch incision around the belly button, and that's how we take the kidney out. We do all the surgery through that one incision, and it's really a step forward for the donors so that the donors can recover and get back to their lives as quickly as possible. That's going to be, as you can see, the bottom thing is robotic donor nephrectomy, and we're just starting on that. That's part of an investigative research protocol that uh, we really believe may be the next step forward. Um, and the University of Maryland moving living donation forward has always been a very large part of what we do. Uh, nope, stay on the one slide. Um, uh, the other thing we can do is we use a lot of um, kidneys from uh, pediatric donors. So I've put in kidneys from uh, donors as, as young as two months of age. And we've used those. Many, many programs across the country won't use those kidneys, uh, but we can put them in and we have great outcomes with those, those kidneys. Um, and it's just another way to get more opportunity. The other thing that we do, many patients have uh, polycystic kidney disease as part of their as the reason for their kidneys to fail. And these kidneys can get very large. So a normal kidney um, is about the size of your fist. A polycystic kidney can get to be the size of one of these balloons or even bigger. So I've seen them this big. Can you imagine carrying two of those around all the time? And uh, many programs in the United States will make, if they're that big, they want to take them out, but they won't take them out at the same time they're doing the kidney transplant. Whereas at the University of Maryland, we've been doing this for at least 20 years where the patients come in, we take out their kidneys, and the donor, the kidney's coming out while the, while the recipient's kidneys are being removed, then they, they have their transplant, and they usually go home from the hospital in about five days. Um, the other thing that we've moved into now is, you know, transplanting patients. There's, there's a lot of people that are overweight in the world, and many programs won't touch them. And... Um, we look, we, we're looking into that. Talked about single, uh, uh, single port donor nephrectomy, which is the one incision I talked about in robotic. We can go on the next slide. I don't have a lot of slides. I just want to, we're going to highlight a few things and then I want to go on and tell you a couple stories because I think the stories will really bring home what this is about. So what does this tell you? The National Kidney Registry, you heard a little bit about Parrot Exchange this morning from what, from actually, he was my first boss, Dr. Swanson at Walter Reed. We worked together. And um, the National Kidney Registry is the largest donor, kidney donor swap program in the world. They've done over 1,200 transplants since February 14th, 2008. I remember that because it was Valentine's Day and um, I was involved in that first set of swaps. I was one of the surgeons. I, I performed one of the transplants. I came to the University of Maryland three years ago and I got us involved in this program, and we're now the fourth largest center involved with the National Kidney Registry. We do somewhere between 15 and 20 parrot exchange transplants a year. And the importance of parrot exchange is some people will come in and they will have a donor, but their donor's blood type isn't right. Or they've had a previous transplant and they have antibodies against their particular donor or they've had some blood transfusions and they have antibodies. And this is a way to get a completely negative cross match from a living donor in a very rapid fashion. Most of our patients we can get transplanted through paired exchange in less than six months. Uh, next slide. So let me talk to you a little bit about patient stories. So, um, and I gotta, I gotta remember all the stories. I remember the first one that I wanna tell you about is kind of exemplifies what's the difference and how, how, how do you get treated differently if you come to um, a group of surgeons that this is what they do and they work with nephrologists. So this, this is a woman who lives on Smith Island and I'm sure everybody knows Smith Island. You can only get there by ferry. If you're on hemodialysis, it is a no-go. You cannot live at your home on Smith Island and go to hemodialysis, impossible. She was on peritoneal dialysis. She had a few infections in her abdomen. She went to a surgeon and he said, well, we have to have, get rid of the catheter for three months in order to get you back on peritoneal dialysis. Three months away from home. She would not have been able to go home. She would have to live, rent a place on the, on the mainland here so that she could get dialysis. Somebody said, why don't you go up and see the, the 
access program up at Easton. She came to see me. Um, I said, okay, well, we'll take it out and we'll schedule your surgery to put it back in for two weeks following the removal. So we scheduled both surgeries at the same time. If for some reason there's a problem and we can't put it back in at that time, we'll have to readjust fire. I said, if you get another infection after that, then we may have to go to three months or a little bit longer. The story ends, we were able to get this catheter back in two we into her in two weeks. She did fabulously well. Two months later, she drove to Baltimore and my partner put a kidney in. She is off of dialysis. She's living on Smith Island, and she's doing exceedingly well. Um, the next uh, person I want to talk about is a, a gentleman who lives at the very southern part of the eastern shore in Virginia. And he has had a transplant, but he's, and it's, it's kind of moving along, and it's doing fine, but he's had a lot of issues with some rejection, and he's afraid that he may lose that kidney at some point. He had a fistula in his arm that was working exceedingly well. In fact, it was working too well. Sometimes what can happen, if you have a fistula and that fistula works too well, too much blood goes through that fistula. He had 2,500 cc's per minute, two and a half liters a minute of blood was going through that fistula. The normal heart pumps between two and four liters a minute. So a half of what he was pumping a minute was going through his fistula, and he was developing symptoms of congestive heart failure. He would get short of breath. He couldn't go out and do his walks. He, couldn't, he, was, he, did a, he does a lot of uh, woodworking. He couldn't do that because he was all, always short of breath. He was getting fluid on his lungs. And he went to several surgeons who said, we have to, have to just get rid of that fistula. Um, I've been... For the last five years, I've been doing a procedure where we can go in and we can uh, wrap the origin of the fistula with a specific type of graft that's made from the carotid artery of a cow, actually. And it creates uh, resistance to flow because if you, anybody knows physics, if something's narrow and it's long, it's going to be hard. You know, a little tiny straw that you get with your drink, it's hard to drink through that straw, right? But if you have a big fat straw, it's easy to drink, right? Well, if we can narrow down the origin of that fistula, we can decrease the flow. And uh, so I said, we can try this. And I said, you know, we may, have to, we may have to tweak it a little bit. Sometimes I go in and I narrow it down, and I don't narrow it enough. So they have to come back. i got to do it again. Most of the time, I get it right. We measure the flow in the operating room. But we were able to go in, we were able to narrow it down, he kept his fistula, his kidney's still working, but he now has that insurance policy. He understood that he wanted to have, as Dr. Hinduja put it, that money in the bank. Uh, and he's done very well. I've got to remember my other two stories here. I need my notes, sorry. Um, I think the other thing that I think is kind of a, a new place we're going is uh, we have patients who uh, are, uh, they're heavy, and there are some patients that uh, have lost a lot of weight, but they get to a point where they can't lose more, especially because if you're on dialysis, and the dialysis takes your energy away, and it's three days a week, it's not like, excuse me, it's not like you can do a lot of exercise or really work in that way. So I've had a couple of patients that have come in. They're very young patients in their 40s. And they um, didn't have diabetes. They just had high blood pressure. And they had, they had a living donor. And we made the decision to move forward with transplant. Even though they had, we, we, we talk about BMI, which is body mass index, which is an index of how, how tall you are and how, how much you weigh. And mo many programs in the country won't look at patients over 30 or 35. We tend to have our upper limit of normal around 40. Uh, but we're starting to even push that envelope if we have the right patient, if they don't have certain comorbidities, if their heart functions are, is good, and if they're, um, um, <coughs> if they're younger and, and, and we think that their risk of having complications following the surgery is is reasonable. So 
That's another um, um, group. And then there's a whole group of patients. At, at the University of Maryland, we've been doing laparoscopic donor nephrectomy for so long, we now have a lot of expertise in taking out kidneys and using kidneys that many other programs won't do. So we have um, a, we've had, I had a patient who was 27 years old. She was turned down by several centers because her donor <coughs> had three arteries that went to her kidney. And many programs won't entertain those types of donors. They won't, they, they feel that the risk is too high to use those types of kidneys. So we took her donor to the operating room, got the kidney out safely through that small incision, put the kidney in, and she's doing very well. And this was a patient who was down to her very last access. She had a, an access, a, a graft in her left groin, which is the last place that we like to go. And uh, she also had um, occlusion of all of the blood vessels up in her shoulders and her neck. All of her veins were occluded. So she had no other options aside from this. And other programs had turned her down, and we were able to get her transplanted. Uh, let me see if I have one more. Oh, okay. The final thing I wanted to talk about uh, was um, the site, this, this issue with um, patients who have polycystic kidney disease. So we ha recently, and we get patients that come from, we actually have a patient right now, a nine-year-old boy who's, this is for, the, uh, for a multiple renal arteries. He lives in London. And no program in the entirety of Great Britain will consider using his donor who has, has I can't remember if that's two or three arteries. So we may have a, somebody coming from all the way from Great Britain to have a living donor transplant at the University of Maryland. Um, but the, the final piece is we have um, had a patient who was uh, from Pittsburgh, and he had polycystic kidney disease. He was 37 years old, two kids. His father-in-law wanted to give him a kidney, and uh, he also wanted, because he had a job, he had to support his family, he wanted to be able to get, his kidneys were these big kidneys I was talking about, he wanted to be able to get the surgery done, get the new kidney in so that he could get back to work. So he could get back to the job of raising his young children who were five, six. He wanted to get back to the job of being married to his wife. And we were able to do that for him. He did exceedingly well. I think he left the hospital on post-op day four, went back to Pittsburgh, and is doing very well. So I guess in the end, what I think is the most important is that you want to have, and, and I can't do this. I don't do this by myself. Quite frankly, I stand on the shoulders of probably somewhere between 70 and 100 people who are the nurses that are helping us get patients worked up, who are the nurses that are helping us follow up the patients, the nurses that are working up our living donors for, for donation. Uh, we have uh, nurse practitioners that work with us in the hospital to take care of the patients postoperatively. We have nephrologists that are partners in the community, like Dr. Hinduja and I'm sure many of you, if you're from Salisbury, are uh, involved with the Peninsula, what are they, Peninsula Nephrology, Dr. Khan and Baswell and those folks. Um, we do this by um, creating relationships with the community. Uh, we recently started an evaluation program uh, at Peninsula Regional after Peninsula Regional came to us and said, we'd like to provide better care for our patients with end-stage renal disease. So um, we have a commitment to any patient who can get to our hospital or one of the hospitals with whom we work or that's part of our system who have end-stage renal disease to give them the best possible care that we can. Uh, I think we have one more slide. Oh, and this is um, a picture 
that um, was from my other life. Before I um, went, before I came back into civilian life, I was in the Army for four years. That's where I met Dr. Swanson. But I also deployed twice to Iraq. This was in Baghdad as the sun set over uh, downtown Baghdad. And you can see the cross sabers there. And uh, this, this thing is the Tomb of the Unknowns right here. Um, but uh, I spent a little while over there. That was a nice area. One more slide. And I would be happy to answer any questions that you folks have. And I thank you for your attention. I want to thank the National Kidney Foundation for putting this together. Right. I go to Dr. Khan up in there with him for 18 years. Right. And once in a while, he still likes me to convince me to come. Right. Uh, get a second opinion. And I'm having no problem. Right. Do y'all plan on ever having a clinic possibly on the East Coast floor from the University of Maryland? Um, well, we have an evaluation clinic. Um, it is definitely uh, in our mind to create that post transplant piece down here, um, and it's kind of, uh, we're still dreaming about it, but it's, uh, I think it will come. The question is when, I'm not sure, uh, but I agree with you, it would be uh, really advantageous. It's something that actually Trisha Rosenberry and I, we talk all the time about how are we going to do this, when are we going to do it. We talked to Dr. Hinduja about it, because we also have to have the right nephrology support in order to make it happen. So. Uh, yes, not sure when, but it's definitely on my radar screen of what I'd like to see. We're trying. Yeah, our goal ultimately would be spectacular if you could come up, get your transplant, leave, and never have to go across the bridge unless there's a real problem. Uh -huh. um, and, and believe me, I get it. I, I drive down here usually on average once a week, sometimes twice a week. I think in two weeks I'm going to be down here three times. Uh, or I mean, it's some, some, so I, I'm, I got the drive. Um, but uh, and and I, it was really interesting when I, I we came down to, um, uh, for the first time we were gonna do the, the clinic at Peninsula Regional, which we do four times a year. And I had to go to Princess Anne. And I went to Princess Anne, and I, we're driving back, and I turned to Trish Rosenberry and I said, I understand. <laughs> I did not understand how far it is. 